Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Jewish Museum. My name is Jenna Weiss. I'm the manager of public programs here, so it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event, H.G. Adler, A Survivor's Dual Rever Reverie, co-presented with the Penn World Voices Festival of International Literature, so we're so pleased to be partnering with them on this event. For information about all of our upcoming public programs and events, please visit our website, sign up for our e-news. Following the discussion this evening, there will be a book signing with the authors at the, this table. So books, selected works are available for purchase at the table near the door. So we try to, uh, if you have a book already, that's great. And then we just can line up um, and get your books signed, um, as well as the reception in the back of the room. So please stay and, and have a glass of wine with us. And now I would like to introduce Donica Bettinen from the Penn World Voices Festival, who will provide us with a little more information about tonight's event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenna, and thank you very much to the Jewish Museum for partnering with the Penn World Voices Festival on tonight's event. Uh, it's wonderful for us to be here, and thank you very much for being here. Uh, a note of apology first, Daniel Mendelssohn was to join us tonight, but unfortunately he's unwell, so you will perhaps have noted his absence. Um, but I'm very pleased to introduce you to a most esteemed panel um, tonight to talk about the work of H.G. Adler. Um, and as a programmer for a literary festival, this is a really fascinating prospect, a writer who has written about his own and others' experiences, both uh, from a fictional perspective and in an academic examination. Uh, joining us tonight, Edwin Frank will be moderating the discussion with Peter Filkins, Ruth Franklin, and H.G. Adler's son, Jeremy. Please join me in welcoming them, and have a great night. Hi, thanks. I'm Edwin Frank, uh, and as um, Donica just said, I'm the moderator. Uh, let me just say a few words of introduction uh, for the other panelists. Um, Jeremy Adler, at my right, uh, is a poet, critic, and a scholar of German literature who taught for many years at King's College London. He's a f sorry, sorry. Uh, let me get the um, the microphone working. There's, it's working there, right? So Jeremy Adler is a poet, critic, and a scholar of German literature who taught for many years at King's College London. He's a frequent contributor to the TLS, the London Review, among other periodicals, and has recently published a novel, The Mages of Portobello Road. He is the only child of H.G. Adler. Peter Filkins, uh, next on my right, uh, is the author of four books of poetry and the translator from German, notably of the poems of Ingeborg Bachmann, and of three novels by our subject tonight, H.G. Adler, of which the third, The Wall, came out, I believe, last fall. Um, Filkins is a recipient of a Leon Levy Biographical Fellowship, and he is working on a biography of Adler. He teaches at Bard College at Simon Rock, Simon's Rock. And finally, farthest uh, to my right, Ruth Franklin is the author of A Thousand Darknesses, Lies and Truth in Holocaust Fiction and is also, like Peter, a uh, recipient of a Leon Levy Biographical Fellowship. She's working on a biography of Shirley Jackson. She's one of our finest critics of literature and a contributor in the past to the New Republic, uh, as well as to the New Yorker and the New York Review of Books, again, among other journals. And as I said, perhaps inaudibly before, my name is Edwin Frank, and I'm the editor of the New York Review Books Classic series. Um, so we're here tonight to talk about a quite uh, extraordinary writer and uh, figure, uh, a man who was born in 1910, who in the late 30s uh, was um, forced to do slave labor. Uh, he was born in Prague, uh, then was in Theresienstadt for two and a half years, uh, then in Auschwitz and Buchenwald and survived. And then after going briefly to Prague, went back to London where he lived the rest of his life, writing six novels, of which we now have three in English, uh, only two of which I believe saw publication during his life, also writing two major studies, almost, um, well, hard to describe, we'll talk about that later, uh, but hugely important, uh, one of Theresienstadt and one of uh, the, of I believe it would translate, the book would translate as administered man. Um, so uh, these men who, who is unusual in crossing the uh, boundaries between nonfiction, especially kind of sociological, historical 
again, um, some ways difficult to categorize nonfiction and also intensely working on fiction. It's also unusual, frankly, for people to write um, six long novels, only four of which get published. R novels, in a sense, depend on publication. They're a lot of work. Um, and to sit around laboring on them year after year without publication is sometimes, I think, rather demoralizing. But we're talking about a, 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 a very driven man, a man who saw the most, uh, uh, well, who lived in a broken century but tried in some sense to see things whole. Uh, I thought I'd begin, well, we were going to begin with a reading, appropriately enough. We should actually hear something um, of, of uh, the voice or the voices that, that come into Adler's fiction. And I believe that uh, Jeremy is going to read a passage from The Wall. Yes, that can you hear me? Yeah. Barely. Hmm. Can you hear me better? Yeah. OK, I'll try. Um, I just want to say, first of all, how glad I am to be here and um, how appropriate it is, in a way, that H.G. Adler is represented in this situation for two reasons. One is that he worked in the Jewish Museum in Prague briefly after the Second World War uh, and then problematized the whole issue of putting Jewish history and exterminated people into a museum. And the second reason is that he was president of the exile pen of German writers, of which previously Thomas Mann had been president. Those writers who removed themselves from Germany or who were expelled and created their own pen and were affiliated to the international pen. So for those two reasons, uh, it's particularly appropriate that my father is remembered here tonight. I'm going to read a brief passage from The Wall, uh, segueing two sections together. The Wall revolves around a character who has been, who has experienced the worst, and who comes through and wants to tell the world about his experiences, but finds the world unwilling to listen. And he has to cope with the dual problem of his past as he looks back and his present as he looks around at an incomprehending world. And he finds himself cut off from the world by the wall of the title and by his existence in nothingness. And that's what comes up in this passage. We are, we are remnant survivors. This is Peter Filkin's translation. We are remnant survivors who are there for all who are not. That's true in general. The living are there for the dead, for their predecessors. And thus we also represent the history of the dead. How difficult it is then to exist as oneself when we are also history so much history. I think of myself as something that is split into pieces, but not something pathological, because the pieces are, are also linked to one another, though this is questionable. The split apart pieces know of one another. They just aren't joined up. Can you understand when I say that I am not my own master and therefore am split but without being sick? Look, this was particularly true when everything seemed questionable, everything that happened, not just me alone, for that would easily have been pathological. But instead, the questionable became dominant in an environment where, for many, the questionable was transformed into that which could not be questioned, because doing so cast them down and ate them up. Perhaps I have simply ensconced myself within nothingness and cannot exist in any other way. I thought we should give some biographical uh, a sense of context um, other than just the Shoah. Uh, and so, um, Peter, maybe you could talk a bit about the milieu, uh, intellectual and also social, um, uh, political, uh, in which um, uh, Adler came of age. Sure. Um, um, I could even, I thought it, we have a photo of H.G. Adler uh, later in life, uh, towards the end of his life. Everybody hear me? Okay. Uh, he's born, in, as Edward said, uh, in 1910 in Prague. And uh, 
the single child of the family. Uh, his father runs a book bindery and stationery uh, business. So you're talking about a middle class uh, successful businessman and as so often happens, uh, the next generation turns to the arts and uh, uh, produces intellectuals. Uh, Prague, uh, Czech Czechoslovakia uh, gains independence in 1918 for the first time in 300 years uh, from the Habsburg Empire. And Adler himself said that he was born uh, into the German language, uh, also uh, the Czech language. Uh, the he is part of the Prague uh, German Jews, uh, though a small uh, in number in, in Prague themselves, they are enormously influential as writers, artists, uh, they have two theaters, uh, which are very celebrated, uh, several newspapers as well. So, and this, of course, is the world of Franz Kafka, uh, which he came from. Kafka was enormously important for Adler as a writer. But, and uh, Adler's father and Kafka went to the same grammar school. They were just one year apart. Uh, so this is a very small world, but also uh, an enormously productive and influential world. Uh, Adler himself, very uh, young, t uh, is attracted to uh, the arts, to, the, to science, uh, to writing, to music. And uh, Czechoslovakia gains its independence in 1918 when he's eight years old. And uh, there's an enormous rebirth uh, in, in the culture. So uh, the independence of Czechoslovakia lasts from 1918 to 1938. As someone has pointed out, until 1930, uh, 1989 and the Velvet Revolution, these were the only 20 years of independence in th over 300 years. So you have a great renaissance uh, of artists. Uh, Cubism is imported from Paris uh, in the 1910s, 1920s. I think sometimes we think of Prague as a sort of smoky, stony, old world uh, kind of city. And while it has a lot of uh, Baroque and Gothic architecture, this is an uh, enormously um, vibrant uh, place of uh, the arts of photography, uh, surrealist photography, uh, and of course of writers like Franz Kafka, Franz Werfel, uh, Karol Czapek, uh, who invents the word robot in one of his plays that we, that we have now. Adler himself studies, goes on to study musicology he was a member of the Wandervogel, the Scouts, uh, which was enormously important to him as it was to many. These later, this was later perverted to become the Hitler Youth, but in no way was the Hitler Youth at the time. A very idealistic, very moral uh, organization which uh, loved scouting and being in nature and trying to uh, live a purposeful and uh, idealistic life. Uh, is very, as are many, is very heavily Ill influenced by Eastern mysticism. The Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads, uh, was himself a member of a mystical circle with the Czech uh, photographer Frantisek uh, Durtokol from 1928 to 1935. So this is someone who was a Central European intellectual, uh, a polymath, studying all kinds of different subject matters, does a dis dissertation on uh, the Baroque poet Klopstock and mus music, and uh, earns his doctorate in 1935, and really is on a trajectory to uh, become a professor, perhaps an editor, uh, the head of a cultural organization, and of course, by 1938, uh, things begin to, to close down. Uh, he and his wife are deported to Theresienstadt in February of 1942, along with her wife, uh, her mother. Uh, they are in Theresienstadt for two and a half years. Uh, Gertrude, his wife, is the head of the uh, uh, laboratory in, in Theresienstadt. And this gains, uh, protects Adler himself because there, she's a very prominent figure and a very important figure in the camp. Uh, so it protects him and her, frankly, from deportation and allows her to have access to a great uh, many documents uh, in from the administration of the, of the camp. And Adler basically starts stealing the documents and, uh, and, and collecting them because he, as soon as he got to the camp, he realized he wa wanted to capture the camp in both literature and in scholarship. 
and indeed he writes short stories, he starts a novel, he writes 130 poems while he's in Tradenstadt, and he uh, collects documents and starts thinking about how to do a study of the camp if he were to survive. Uh, and then he and his wife uh, and her mother are deported to Auschwitz in October of 1944. Uh, the mother is selected out on the ramp. Uh, Gertrude can't bear for her mother to die alone, so she goes with the mother herself and both are gassed. Uh, Adler himself is in the camp for two weeks, which is a, the most important two weeks of his life, he considered. He speaks with a number of Orthodox Jews there, and himself, his family w were uh, a secular Jewish family. They really, religion played no role in the family, as he himself says, though he had a very strong spiritual uh, interest in religion and theology in him uh, in the 1920s and 1930s. But it's really in the camps that he, he, he came to Judaism in a very grounded fashion. He was not interested in Zionism, though Z Zionism was, of course, a huge force in Prague of the 1910s uh, and 1920s as well. But he, this is something that he turned away from. And survives, he's in Auschwitz for two weeks, uh, and then goes on to two other camps, one called Niederroschel, uh, in the area of a neighboring camp of Buchenwald, and then a last camp, Langenstein, in the also a neighboring camp of Buchenwald and near Haberstadt, uh, which was in some ways the most brutal camp. Uh, and he's liberated by the Americans in 1945, returns to Prague, and then emigrates to London in 1947. I think that's basic outline. And it's really, I mean, he, he, he's always wanted to be a writer, but in some sense he, he finds what he, wa what he has to write about when he is in, in, in Theresienstadt. Um, he, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, he, he publishes a, a, a book of poems in 1931, which later he disowned. Uh, and he had started writing novels, but none survive. He lost all his, his papers. So I think what's interesting, he, when he enters the camps, he's 32 years old with a doctorate, having uh, aspired already to be a writer. So he brings a scholar's eye and a writer's eye, fully trained, f uh, nascent really, uh, at, at the age of 32, to the camp. So it's a very special sensibility. Um, it's a sensibility not created by the camps, but enlarged, deepened, and extended by the camp experience. Uh, Jeremy, you say in your the afterward to the Theresienstadt book, which will finally come out in English translation, I think next fall, immense book, a thousand pages, um, that uh, it was when you were a child, really, to begin to do to work on these novels, right? And then also on that book, which was finished, well, uh, I mean, you were, I think, a very young child indeed when he'd already finished it, but that you say he would work 18 hours a day on the various projects he was working on. Uh, what was it like? <laughs> Well, that's right. He came to London in he came to London in 1947 uh, to escape the communist take the imminent communist takeover in Czechoslovakia. Uh, he had no wish to be Stalin's guest, having already uh, paid homage to Hitler, and uh, he was uh, able to escape to Britain and uh, settle there uh, and uh, spend the rest of his life in London until he died in 1988. He was absolutely impassioned about the need to bear witness and to testify to not just his experience, that wasn't really so ever so important to him, as the experience of others. Uh, for instance, you often find him talking about the experience of old people in the camp, both in the fiction and in the uh, Theresienstadt book, uh, people who are normally excluded from discussion and examination, how confused old people would become when they arrived at the camp so that they would disintegrate and die within a fortnight of having arrived. So terrible was the experience that they had to endure. So it was for the dead, uh, as that passage that I uh, quoted before indicated, for the dead that he saw the need to write, and that gave him tremendous energy and power uh, and set him working at the typewriter for 18 hours a day on the first version of the Theresienstadt book, which was published in 1955. It was extremely difficult to find a publisher for that. Uh, Hannah Arendt tried uh, in vain. 
Hermann Broch, uh, at Yale, also tried in vain. Uh, there was no route to publication in the United States, which my father hoped would be his ultimate destination. And it was only through the in mediation of Theodore Adorno, eventually, that the money was found for the publication of the book so that it could come out in 1955 with an enormous subvention for those days. I don't remember exactly how much, but it was a very large sum that was needed to guarantee the publication. Uh, and the book uh, looks at life in the camp in the round. Every conceivable aspect of life in the camp is studied. The history of the camp, the sociology of the camp, the psychology of the camp, the administration of the camp, uh, the medical situation in the camp, the diet in the camp, the cultural life in the camp, and so forth. So that he gives a huge rounded picture of life, of the kind of rounded picture that you normally only get in literature uh, when by a completely different route. F the first years in London were years of extreme hardship and penury. He had practically nothing to live on um, and was like his friends in this regard. He was friends with uh, Elias Canetti, the later Nobel laureate, with Erich Fried, the poet, with Franz Bermann Steiner, the poet and anthropologist, with the translator Michael Hamburger. These people formed a little circle of exiles in London, in those days wholly unknown, but later destined uh, to become uh, sought after writers and famous names. Um, so it was this very small, almost inbred group of writers that you have to imagine him living in uh, in the uh, 40s and early 50s until the Theresienstadt book is published and a radical change occurs when Martin Buber reads the book, Gershom Scholem reads the book, President Hoyes reads the book and he is universally accepted as a major Holocaust scholar. That's, a, that's the, the turning point in his career as a scholar. And there I think I'll stop. I just, I don't know if I, this is a map. This is the uh, frontispiece from the Theresian Stop book, which is of course a map of Theresian Stop uh, itself. Uh, just to say one, I mean, I think it's just very important to emphasize those of you who know, that Theresienstadt is so different than Auschwitz or Buchenwald. This, this is a ghetto, and uh, it was a 18th century fortress town, uh, 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 army barracks, which was converted into it. It basically holds about 7,000 people, and at its height had 60,000 people. Uh, 1.2 uh, square meters of space for each person uh, wi within the, within the uh, town itself. Um, you were saying that he, he was felt a co uh, compulsion to bear witness. Um, there's also a question that was, um, I think, for anybody writing at that point of what form bearing witness to the to things that boggled the imagination, uh, just at numerical levels and, and but also at human levels. Um, one form, I mean, in some sense, and we'll get back to this. The Treasure Shop book finds is a very peculiar, is a, a different form of an investigation. Uh, and the documentation, uh, but let's turn to the novel because, um, for a little bit, because he, he's also in these, what, it's really in 10 or 15 years, the, the um, panorama is written right after the war, around the same time, right, the, uh, the journey shortly thereafter, uh, and then maybe another decade later, he finishes the wall or not even? No, within, with, uh, 19, Panorama's 1948, Journey 1951, and The Wall 1956. Okay, so, so I mean, these are really almost overlapping endeavors. Um, and uh, the three books that have been translated, I mean, each in some sense has as a title, a kind of metaphor. Uh, it's interesting, I mean, Panorama, I believe, starts with uh, his going as a child to a panorama. Uh, and then, uh, uh, but of course the panorama that his life unfolds, because it's kind of Bildungsroman, is rather different from the panorama of uh, childhood. Obviously the journey is a kind of metaphor, um, and the wall a different one. I think it's actually the invisible wall, isn't it in German, the literal translation or the? It uh, is, yeah, yeah. Um, but he wished to call it the wall, uh -huh. and the publisher talked him, or 
demanded that it not be called that because there was another novel called The Wall at the same time. Uh -huh. And so in translation, I was able to restore the title. Okay. Um, Ruth, you've written about Holocaust novels. Um, how do you think, how does Ad Adler's way of, of trying to finding a form to bear witness that is a novelistic and imaginative form to deal with, with uh, very real events uh, compare to other people doing that at the time or since? Well, there's so much to say about this question, and I assume that we'll, we'll discuss it at length, so I'll just say briefly a couple of things now. Um, Jeremy, I was so interested to hear you say in those words that it was important that, that he had determined to bear witness, because one thing that's so striking about Adler is not only that he wrote about the camps in both fiction and nonfiction, which did make him unusual as a Holocaust writer, I can only think of a few who fall in that category. I would say Elie Wiesel, of course, um, Primo Levi, um, but Levi's fiction is sort of uh, on a second tier, I think it might be safe to say, compared to his memoirs. Um, what's interesting about Adler is, number one, that his fiction and nonfiction are both of such high quality. And I, I can't, in fact, think of another writer of the Holocaust for whom that's true. Um, and then I was also struck to hear you say that the Therese and Shep book was such a great success because in light of that, it's um, sh quite shocking that his novels didn't find a similar kind of success um, during his lifetime. Again, correct me if I'm wrong, but that was the impression that I, I had had. And I s I s when I wrote about Adler, I speculated a little bit about why that might be. And I think part of the reason is because he wrote about the Holocaust in so many genres fiction, nonfiction, poetry, essays, but he didn't write in the genre that was most popular and most expected after the war, which was, of course, the personal chronicle or memoir. And I think in the years after the war, when those chronicles were, were so widely read, um, of course, I, don't, I almost don't have to name them, but you know, I'm thinking of Tadeusz Borowski's book, This Way to the Gas, or um, Levy's if, if, if This is a Man, or of course, Elie Wiesel's Night. Um, Adler refused to write mm. in this vein. Um, and one can think of these memoirs, they're all, of course, like all memoirs, they sort of straddle the line between fact and fiction. But it's interesting to me that Adler didn't want to straddle mm. that line in a single book, but rather separated out the genres into these distinct categories. And it, you know, it's almost a stretch to read these books and to call them autobiographical because, of course, we know that they are in some way based on the events of his life. But they also reject the role of witness in the way that it's normally understood in the sense that, for one thing, um, they don't have any names in them, or very <laughs> few. The narrators don't share Adler's name. Um, and he refuses to name, for instance, Hitler. Um, he talks about the Jews, I think in each book he talks about them as the lost, mm. right, rather than um, naming them. Um, and he uses many similar abstractions rather than giving us the specifics. And I think it was Primo Levi who said that um, any chronicle without, without the what and the where, uh, the chron a chronicle has no value. And I think Adler's books show us that for whatever reason, he wasn't trying to make them chronicles. They were truly works of imagination. Yeah, I think that's very much the point that he doesn't just want to describe, he wants to imagine from the bottom up these, these again, seemingly unimaginable things. Um, it's interesting, I mean, mm -hmm. you were saying why didn't the novels have a very good reception? I mean, my sense has always been that here Adorno, who had had uh, facilitated the publication of Theresienstadt uh, was rather a poet, was not responsive to the fiction and not responsive to this endeavor. Um, this was an important and also a, a, a vexed relationship. That's right, it was a complicated relationship. The um, Adorno uh, and many others couldn't cope with the, the novel, the journey, partly because uh, the writer Adler which is to negate himself and exclude himself from the discussion and re exclude his own personal experiences, as Ruth was, Ruth was saying, to create an imaginative, fictional vision of the Holocaust, partly because he turns away from the normal external account of events, um, 
the physical details of suffering, the appearance of corpses, and so forth, in order to imagine the inner nature of the victim. And that marks a, a major break from everything that he saw around him. And uh, he made that turn from the external reality to the inner reality of the, the, the psychology of the victim uh, in Thierry's Introduct itself. And uh, that, although he greatly admired Levy, um, that marks a, a breach with Levy and Levy's whole point, uh, and it goes against Adler's belief, notion of truth and uh, witness. It's such a, he's, um, I was thinking of other parallels. In a way, he's more parallel to figures lesser known in this country, like Jean Améry, Jean Améry and uh, Hans Kielsen also writes a book uh, which was done the other year, which also does not call the Jews the Jews and refers to Hitler. So there, and he's he's working as a psychologist. So there's this kind of overlap of of uh, people working both on nonfiction and fiction. Um, as a novelist, I mean, he also has certain kind of novelistic pre precursors he draws on, which are really very much from the the great modernists. Um, Kafka, of course, he he seemed to uh, well, Kafka was for him a, a, an absolute touchstone. But I was thinking, reading around, that, that Broch and Canetti seemed to be, could you talk about his sort of the aesthetic, um, you know, sort of the aesthetic antecedents of the work is, uh, that he's... Yeah, um, th that's absolutely right. Um, Kafka, I mean, there's a line, Kafka, Musil, Broch, Canetti, and Joyce. And these are the people who are, for him, the masters. And one thing that he learned from Joyce was that every book has to be completely different. Just as the portrait and Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake are all utterly different from each other, so he believed uh, his own fiction should be, uh, e each, each fictional world should be unique and should have no real links to the neighboring novel. That explains partly the very original character of each of the novels. From modern fiction, he also took techniques like montage and symbolism and free and direct speech and the unreliable narrator, all these things that we're used to from modern fiction to portray the Holocaust. And uh, one American reviewer came to the conclusion that he was writing uh, Holocaust modernism. Um, and with all modifications, that seems to be not wholly inappropriate as a view. I would, if, I just want to add two things just uh, to clarify that Again, the, the difficulty he had in, in publishing the novels, he finished, completes Panorama in 1948. It is not published till 1968. The Journey is completed in 1951. It's not published until 1962. And The Wall, completed in 1956, was not published until 1989, a year after his death, and he had no knowledge that it was going to be published at all. And then there are three other novels in the archive, uh, which are in manuscript and have never seen uh, the the, li the light of day. And the, I guess the second thing I would add about the Theresienstadt book is he is no nowhere in it. Um, he, this is not a memoir, or as Ruth was saying, it's not a chronicle. It's a scholarly study of the smallest details and the largest conceptual sociological uh, forces at work in, in, in the camp. Only in an appendix does he say, oh, by the way, this is my experience. I was in this camp and in Trajestat, and it's about a two-page uh, footnote, really. Uh, so he does not include himself. It's, as Jeremy was saying, really empathy for, for all of the, the victims and to really give the very realistic, uh, scientific picture of what what that experience was like. And lastly, he said about his fiction that it was steeped in autobiography, but was not autobiography. Um, if someday he 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 planned to write his memoirs, unfortunately, he never did. But if he did, he would then tell the truth. That this was the truth, but it was not his private truth. It was a truth a fictional truth that he arrived at um, by writing his novels. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. There you go. Yeah, um, I was thinking that the idiom, though, of the novels, and this reminded me of Broch, perhaps most of it, is, is intensely philosophical. I mean, it, it, he writes about, you know, there are some names, there, especially the Panorama, right? There's a kind of, there's a, but, uh, but even, there's lots of argumentation, there's lots of ways of almost abstracting as if you saw everything through a miasma uh, sometimes. It must have been very difficult to translate. 
Brock, <laughs> is, in, Brock, Brock is immensely important for him, uh, for the Theresienstadt book too. The uh, Brock Sleepwalkers contains the essay on the disintegration of values and uh, reflection on that essay of Brock's in the Sleepwalkers helped to sustain my father during the war in Theresienstadt. He reflected very deeply on what Brock calls the disintegration of values, and later they touched on that in their correspondence. And uh, he, incorporated, he incorporated Brock's analysis of modernism, uh, or modernity rather, uh, into the Theresienstadt book. And uh, in the same way, um, for instance, in The Wall, Broch is very much present when H.G. Adler writes about value and values and the value of an individual. This is thinking which comes straight out of Broch. Uh, just to follow up what Edwin has said, there is very little uh, metaphorical language in the novels. Uh, you don't get similes. Uh, there's wonderful descriptive language, particularly of nature. In the wall, there's long passages where uh, Arthur Landau, the protagonist, re re remembers back to walking through the Bohemian forest, which Adler loved, uh, with his first wife in the novel. And the beautiful passages. In fact, I was in this countryside literally just two, three weeks ago and was driving around. And I was so satisfied because I, I had never been there before, but I immediately recognized the countryside as being from the wall that um, he had got it in a very precise and vivid way and, and I felt somehow connected to it uh, in, tr in translating it. Uh, but there, instead, as Jeremy points out, you would get meditative uh, language, philosophical language, sociological language, philosophical language, dream, reverie, nightmare. Um, it's as if he doesn't want the filter of metaphor to be in the way um, between the perception of reality or the mind trying to engage with this experience. He doesn't want to place a metaphor in between reality and the perception of reality. I also, just to go back to the publication circumstances for a moment, um, I wonder, um, Peter, I'd be curious to hear what you've managed to dig up about um, the delay between Adler's writing these novels and the publication and what the reason for that might be. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing that occurs to me is that in the interim period that you were talking about, two other novels did appear that may have, could have paved the way mm -hmm. for a greater acceptance of Adler's brand of imaginative Holocaust writing. I'm thinking of, um, Piotr Rawicz's book, Blood from the Sky, which sadly is uh, very little known in this country, I think more so in Europe, um, but is also a very um, kind of fantastic, um, dreamlike um, story of a, um, a man who's in, a, a Jewish man who's in hiding with his girlfriend, and another book that very explicitly rejects the role of witness, and in fact sort of almost uh, falsifies and fabricates certain scenes in a very um, uh, kind of confusing and also beautiful way. And of course, the other writer I'm thinking of is Imre Kertesz, um, who also, like Adler, does depict the experience of being in the concentration camp um, in a very philosophical, I wouldn't entirely say abstract way, but again, as Jeremy said, it's. Um, very much seen from the inside as the as uh, rather than focusing on the externals of what you know the where and when and what happens, but more about the the personal reaction and what it means in terms of how to go on living afterwards. Could you divide the the two different projects, the Theresienstadt project and on the other hand the novels into one kind of a focus on the mental or the mentality and the other to kind of focus on the mechanism, or is that too crude? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think so, because I think um, both deal deeply with mentality uh, in different ways. The, the novels deal with the mentality of individual victims and perpetrators, uh, and go into the minds of perpetrators even, uh, in... Anne Reise, 
uh, these are perpetrators who are called by the names they gave themselves. So for instance, they may well be referred to as the heroes. Um, there may not be that much metaphor, but there's plenty of irony. Mm. Mm. Um, and in the Therese Introduct book, there's a great deal, not just about the mechanism, but about the mentality of the, um, of the Jews in the ghetto and uh, the perpetrators as well, and the whole uh, ideology which lay behind uh, their bestial deeds. So, um, no, I think he's, we're dealing here with different modes uh, in Oakeshott's sense. I mean, this, the one is the, 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 the literary mode, and the other is the scholarly mode. And um, there are bridges between these, but they are absolutely distinct. And yet, I would, the most important bridge is the language. And this goes back to Ruth's point uh, in, in, in uh, some ways. Uh, the two examples you've given us, uh, the first is written in Polish, and the second is written in Hungarian. And I think this is part of why the novels had such difficulty uh, finding a publisher, never mind an audience. Uh, and that is Adler's intense scrutiny of language. And that happens in both the scholarship and the, and the novel. Um, there is a 630 uh, word glossary that he gives in the Theresienstadt book to give you the, the Nazi language and the language of the administration and the language of the, er of the everyday life in Theresienstadt. The title of the Theresienstadt book is Theresienstadt 1941 to 1945, Das Antlitz einer Zwangsgemeinschaft. And this word Zwangsgemeinschaft, a coerced com community he invents. Um, so Adler, as a, someone who went through this experience and experienced it in auf Deutsch, in German, is able to bring a particular lens to it. This shows up in the fiction, uh, the way that he'll use a word like verboten uh, in almost a mu musical way, ironic, heavily ironic way, as Jeremy points out, or uh, in The Wall, uh, Arthur Landau works in the what is clearly the Prague Jewish Museum, as did Adler, right after the war. And for those of you who don't know, uh, during the war, the Prague Jewish Museum was taken over by the Nazis, particularly Hans Gunther, who was the head of the protectorate, uh, the deportation system, and a reason why H.G. Adler, Hans Gunther Adler, never used his name in uh, as a writer. His, his full name as a writer was always H.G. He refused to uh, publish the name Hans Gunther any further. Uh, it was converted into an, a museum for an exterminated race. Um, they collected all of the materials that had been stolen and set up exhibits of Jewish rituals and Jewish life. Uh, and Mischlinger, who were working in the museum, were, uh, did work on these exhibits and on these, these activities. Uh, anyhow, Arthur Landau works in such a museum and he is carrying portraits of the ancestors of the deceased, uh, the lost, up and down from, from the basement of the museum to the top. And the word he uses is schleppen. Uh, and he is schlepping, if you will, uh, schleppen the portraits. And of course, a schlepper in the, in the camps was someone who uh, tossed bodies onto wagons or into the, into the crematorium. So again, Adler is clearly you know, uh, intensely playing off of this language. And in some ways, it was too close to the bone. It was very hard to deal with. Uh, after finishing the journey, which was the first one I translated, I had to write an introduction. I th said to myself, who is Adler like? You know, uh, what other German Jewish novelists of the camps uh, is he like? And I started sort of casting around for people to read or think about and linkage with him. and. This is a very narrow and specific category. German, Jewish, no novelist, okay? Not memoirists. Um, uh, those who wrote novels directly about their survival experience in the camp. There are only, to my knowledge, I've said this a number of times, I've, no, no one's added another name, and I'm happy for there to be another name, but there are only four. Uh, uh, Jürgen Jakob Becker, uh, writes Jakob uh, the Liar. He was in Sachsenhausen himself. 
And Edgar Hilsenrott writes uh, Nacht, or Night. He was in the Ukraine. And in the 1970s, an Austrian writer, Fred Vander, wrote his, some novels, which were really kind of memoirs uh, disguised as novels. And then there's Adler. Um, so the importance of somebody having gone through this experience, again, as an experienced writer, as an experienced scholar entering it, uh, someone who worshipped the German language. Uh, when we talk about the milieu, he said he was born to the German language, into the Czech language, and into the culture of the ha Habsburg Empire, and then he became a British citizen uh, later on in life. And as a German speaker, he uh, had an advantage in the camps, yes. correct, as being one who could understand what the Nazis were saying. As Levy and others have pointed out, um, many of the Jews died not from uh, their physical torments, but from lack of knowledge, lack of understanding of the rules of the camp. Sure. Well, along that line, one of the things that's very disturbing about the journey is the, is the intense intimacy between persecutor and victim with the victim wanting to believe that somehow this something will turn out all right under these uh, extreme circumstances, uh, a kind of credulity, which is, and the reader is caught up in it at the same time, and the reader has to figure out what's going on in the book, uh, and the reader's, and, and the point of view you're going from is changes all the time, too. So there's a way in which you're just constantly being, you think you're finding your way, but you're also being sucked in and sort of caught, captured. It's, it's a very powerful, uh, effect. And, and he's trying to capture the psychological world of, of the ghetto there. Mm -hmm. um, it, he said it was a much more unreal place than Auschwitz or the other two camps he was in. Preca precisely of what you said, that people walked around believing. They, when, when Jews were first deported to Theresienstadt, they were pleased because it was still within Czechoslovakia rather than going to the east. Mm -hmm. uh, they walked around with an illusion that somehow, you know, things were going to work out fine. There was an immense amount, as we know, an immense amount of culture in Theresienstadt. Operas were written and performed, uh, classical music, painting. Uh, Adler himself gave a poetry reading. He gave a lecture on Kafka's, uh, the 60th anniversary of Kafka's birth with Kafka's favorite sister standing in front of him. Uh, and I would venture to guess that it was probably the only lecture on Franz Kafka's 60th birthday done in a German-speaking uh, country uh, uh, of the time. And uh, we actually still have the notes from it. So there's a tremendous amount of culture uh, going on, and this created this illusion, even delusion, uh, that things were going to somehow work out okay. Did you say, Jeremy, something about the relationship of, uh, to, of Adler to Leo Beck and, the, and, and also in relationship to the Theresienstadt project, right? Because they... Yes, um, my father met Leo Beck in, uh, in the camp. Leo Beck was the head of the German-Jewish community and he was the head, the chief of the elders in Theresienstadt, so he was one of the notables, one of the privileged people. But he also uh, maintained a uh, distance from the politicking of the other elders, which has opened them to so much criticism, uh, not least by my father. Um, and uh, the encounter with Leo Beck really introduced my father to Jewish liberal thought. That was a crucial thing uh, for him. Uh, Beck had written a very a uh, profound book, Dieses Volk, This People, uh, about the Jewish people, which gives a, a liberal philosophical account of Judaism. And that became a model for uh, my father in his later thinking. And Beck was much older than my father, but there was a very close relationship. So my father would regularly visit Leo Beck when uh, he was in exile in, in London, and Beck was uh, had an important position in the Jewish community. And very importantly also, uh, all the judgments of individuals in Theresienstadt, which have been so criticized by others, uh, the view of Murmelstein, Edelstein, and the rest, uh, my father read to Leo Beck uh, before he published them to get Beck's independent view uh, of my father's understanding of these men. 
Um, so there was there was a, a close bond between them, though they were very far apart in years and and also in cultural position. Uh, the next, if I can sort of move on from there, from a, the next really important Jewish experience for my, for my father was in Auschwitz, uh, where he was thrown up with a group of Orthodox Jews, um, one from Slovakia called Max Schiff, and they spent their days in Auschwitz arguing about the Talmud and discussing the Talmud. And they were completely unaffected by the surroundings. They laughed them off, this particular group of people, and uh, mocked the Germans. They had to wear, it, there's a little detail in uh, Panorama. The Germans thought that they would humiliate them by giving them prayer shawls instead of shoes. And they laughed at the Germans and said, the Germans are giving us prayer shawls to protect us from evil. Uh, so these people were tremendously important for him, both in the, uh, in, in the way that they introduced him to Talmudic thought and the sayings of the fathers particularly, um, and towards a, an orthodox Jewish attitude which helped them elevate themselves spiritually above their tormentors. Um, your father's last book was a, a book of, of theology, and I believe, right? The one he was working on it at the end of his life. It, I wonder, it struck me that one might say that, that both the fictional, uh, the fictions, the novels, the, those three that at least, well, that are in English, uh, and the Theresienstadt project, of which I've only glanced at the proofs, that um, are united by a concern with what traditionally would have been called theodicy, the, uh, sort of seeing the creation as in some sense um, uh, in spite of all justifiable, a, a place where goodness can come to be, which is to say also you run the risk of, of evil too and decline. Um, would, could, I mean, I'd leave, throw it to any and all of you. Yeah. <laughs> well, he was, uh, he was concerned with what he called theology uh, from the pre-war period in the 30s. He started working on this. He was uh, influenced by a group of thinkers, uh, a philosopher called Unger, uh, and a Jewish thinker called Goldberg, uh, who was friends with Walter Benjamin. And uh, Unger held a group, uh, held a seminar in Berlin to which Brecht and Benjamin and others came, which my father also attended. Uh, and uh, Unger came out of uh, Jewish Neo Kantianism uh, and wanted to restore uh, the imagination to philosophy, wanted to bring back uh, the imagination to contemporary philosophy. And my father picks up ideas from Unger and translates them into his own notion of intuition and the need for intuition in life. And he builds up a whole world out of that, a whole philosophical or theological world, as he called it, um, which sustains him through the, helps to sustain him through the camps and right through his life until a year or so before his death when it's published. And the basic, the, the, the fundamental idea that runs through the book is that practically everything that we do is a, the wrong means to the wrong end. That we're constantly getting in the way of the ultimate reality. That's what he calls theology. And that the theology, politics, are, are as they've been, as they're traditionally or normally understood, are false gods, which prevent us getting down to the brass tacks of living, which he equates with the divine. Uh, turning to a, a well, literary, uh, let's see, we could, I, do we begin to, are there other writers who, whether consciously or not, could be seen as sort of cousins or uh, writers with similar projects to Ador uh, to sorry to Adler uh, whether now because the work does begin to be heard it begins to they people have begun to respond to it or whether they simply have a kind of kinship I mean uh, uh, people not just predecessors uh, like Joyce who we can put him in the context but but people from his own time one might compare him to you mentioned 
well, you, you mentioned the Pole, who's, who, uh, whose name I'm forgetting right now, the blood, uh, but that's not quite the same. That's a different thing, a different way of thinking about the camps. I mean, the writer who um, seems to have been most deeply influenced by Adler is W.G. Zabel, of course, mm -hmm. who um, mentions him in his novel Austerlitz. And it's an interesting kind of influence, I think, because on the surface, they don't seem to have terrifically much in common. Zabel, um, being a German, non-Jew, uh, born during the war, I think, um, or just before it, raised during it, um, growing up as he felt in the shadow of the, of the Holocaust and of the um, bombings perpetrated on Germany um, and dealing with that in his fiction, um, which again is a, is a genre straddling kind of fiction of the precise sort that Adler didn't write. Um, he has these uh, novels that aren't quite novels based on um, some biographical facts combined with uh, photographs and other artifacts, which he then kind of puts this entire veil of imagination over to make it a, a, a coherent and literary story. Um, and I, I'm curious actually about what all of you think about what it is that Zewald saw in Adler and why he was so important to them, but I guess the first thing that occurs to me is that um, both of them were concerned with the goal of excavating the past, of um, being truthful and reanimating or somehow reconstituting the history of the Holocaust in their own very different ways. I, I could, uh, we just happened to have this with us, and uh, I don't know if Ruth even knew it, but. This is W.G. Zabald's map of Theresienstadt, which is actually his adaptation of, uh, of Adler's map. And this is, of course, from Austerlitz. Uh, if you've read Austerlitz, Austerlitz, the title character, loses his mother in Theresienstadt and is devastated when he finds out that she died in Theresienstadt. He goes back to Prague, comes back to England, and wants to read more about Theresa and stuff to, to know more about it. And within the novel, there's a famous 12 page long sentence, which the Germans do very well, uh, mm -hmm. that is all about H.G. Adler and the Theresa Stop book. Um, when I first read Austerlitz in 2001, I didn't know of Adler yet. I thought this character was made up. Uh, when you read Zabaldi, you thought, well, okay, he comes up with some character and names him H.G. Adler, and there's this- They all this could be made up. They all could be, <laughs> yeah. exactly. That's the nature of, of, of Zabald. Uh, and I happened to be at a conference in East, at East Anglia University on Zabald. I did an Adler paper. In fact, I did a paper on these two maps. And uh, there was a graduate student there who knew uh, Max Zebald, uh, and also, uh, I'm sorry, didn't know of him, but uh, was in the copying center and said, did you ever know Max Zebald at all? And the people working in the copying center of the university said, that guy, he was always in here saying, make it look old, make it look old. <laughs> and you can see he purposely doctored this map to in fact give this stain and this sense. And I think it's very interesting, note the library code, the barcode up in the right hand corner. Now, he could have easily, got, easily gotten rid of that, right? No problem at all. For me, Zebald is saying, um, I can take you so far as someone born in the war, uh, 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 not having had to survive it, not being Jewish, uh, but if you want to go further, you're going to have to go to Adler, uh, and then he will take you the next, the next length of the journey. Uh, and I read it really as an homage. Uh, uh, Zabal did have Adler's books uh, in his library, we do know this. A colleague of Jeremy's at uh, King's College London actually went to East Anglia at Zabal's invitation to do a lecture uh, on Adler, uh, Adler's panorama. So he was very much aware of, of Adler's work. And uh, there are other connections which I could go into, but don't have the time right now. Um, well, the last thing I'll, I'll bring up is that I, I think that in, in both the fiction and again, uh, from what I heard about the theological writings and, and, uh, and the imperative to study or document the camp, there was a conviction that the Holocaust was not an essentially, uh, was not, an, not a, an, an, a radically exceptional uh, 
uh, nor uh, an essentially anti-Semitic event. It was a human event. Um, and this is both, I suppose, a matter of hope and a matter of despair in the work to sort of equal degrees, sort of the two of balance. Is that fair to the? Uh yes, I mean, he's concerned to show and to examine uh, the roots of the modern of uh, the Holocaust in modernity itself and the abuse of uh, modern uh, inventions, the perversion of modern science, and also to move ahead from the Holocaust and look forward to future disasters in order to avert them. Uh, and this increasingly becomes his focus with the publication of his second major scholarly book, Administered Man, in 1974. He says he's done with the Holocaust. Uh, he really breaks with Holocaust scholars. He thinks it's far more important to get down to contemporary disasters, contemporary issues, and uh, change uh, abuses of power in the modern world and prevent the possibly preventable. It, it, I actually have a passage from the wall that mm -hmm. I think actually speaks to this. Arthur Landau says actually quite early in the novel, and I think it sets a theme for the novel that Edwin is speaking to. Uh, Arthur says, you have to be able to feel broken and yet not damn the world, to not become callous, not hate your neighbor, not the guilty, for they are your neighbors. You can't separate them from those who are not guilty. Doubt and lack of faith are two very different things. Beware the one who exchanges one for the other or mixes them up. Avoid negation and embrace the end, even praise it. For the end is also a gift and is part of the plan. At the end, you submit yourself and accept your fate. And I think that speaks very much to the notion of embrace of facing what one is brought to one in life by history, by by life, by experience, and somehow, and that's not, as you said, not specific to the Holocaust, but also to any time or place. Yeah. At the same time, I would say, you know, just on the question of uniqueness, Cynthia Ozick um, raises an interesting question in her review of the Wall in the New York Times, um, where she actually wonders whether in 50 years anybody reading these novels will know that they're about the Holocaust. Will they be recognizable? Um, and I, th I think she, she wonders this with a kind of despair. How far removed are they? How are they too abstract? Uh, is, are they too obscure to recognize the facts that they're based on? And you know, I, I think it, despite all, all that, I would, I, w I would say that Adler doesn't in fact stray that far from the facts. That I, I would think the Holocaust is always in some way going to be recognizable, even, you know, even if we see it as the background or the inspiration for these works, um, they're n not going to be other than Holocaust novels. Shall we uh, turn, into, uh, turn to the audience for questions at this point? Do we feel, uh, okay, great. Thank you. Um, you used, in, in the um, portion you read, you used the words, or two words, the plan. Mm -hmm. what, what's meant by that? Whose plan? What plan? Uh, the one, the one, the, pra the part that I just, oh yes, is gift and part of the plan. For the end, is also a gift is, and is part of the plan. I would say it's not the plan of, not the Nazi plan, okay? It's, it, it's the part of the plan of, of life, God's plan, God's plan for us, the cosmos's plan for us, human, human existence's plan for us. Uh, yeah. Does that answer your question? Or? Yeah. Wasn't it uh, possible that after the war and, and with the Holocaust still 
slowly seeping into the consciousness of the world, not less than the United States and London, um, that people were not translating the books because no one talked really about it until 10, 20 years later. And, and in fact, there was a deliberate amnesia that permeated almost everyone, even parents of children who did not speak about it if they right. could possibly avoid it. Right. And I think that was why so many books didn't come out until much later, not only the difficulty of translating. Well, Adler had a large part in changing that, quite frankly. Um, actually, I want to clarify on the first point. I, I, mean, I think it's very important to say Adler is not saying that the God or the forces of the cosmos are planning the Holocaust. In other words, I think he is saying that good and evil are part of the human cosmos and they are constantly interacting. So it's not anything that specific. Secondly, he had a large part in changing the consciousness on the, uh, and that is through radio essays. Uh, in 1961, he and Hermann Langbein do uh, five hours of uh, radio broadcasts, uh, essays really, uh, about Auschwitz and the, the camps. And these were in many ways the first public discussion. This is where people were sitting at home listening to the WDR W Westdeutscher uh, Rundfunk and for five hours over a series of days uh, they were in introduced to this material in very graphic, very specific, very dramatic fashion. So much so that in this past January uh, the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, the WDR rebroadcast the essays. You can, you can listen to them. They are on, uh, online now. Um, and uh, they again were a tremendous success. And that started the process of the Auschwitz uh, trials, which eventually happened in 64, 65 in Frankfurt. And Adler c uh, contributes uh, important affidavits, important uh, information uh, to those trials. Uh, Israel uses an, a 47-page affidavit that he writes uh, uh, about Eichmann that clearly proves that Eichmann knew what he was doing, that he was not just putting people on trains and didn't know where they were going. Uh, it very specifically plots it out. When Eichmann was on trial in Jerusalem, in his cell, he lay on his bed and he read Adler's Theresienstadt book to remind himself of the specifics of what he had done. Um, I'd like to make uh, two points. Um, when I was growing up in post-war, devastated war, so I and people my generation and people of survivor generation thought that Nazism was like an aberration and once it was defeated, things will be better. But now I'm coming to the conclusion, and I wonder if you would agree, that it was just manifestation of evil having a chance to dominate the world's affair, and that it sort of fluctuates. The other thing I wanted to ask you, if you could um, elaborate on this term of existence in nothingness as a way of being if you, you know, once you survive. Thank you. The novel is um, coterminous with a lot of, uh, exi wi with uh, coterminous with existentialism. Um, we have to remember that this is a novel contemporary with, uh, with Camus and Sartre. Um, and also comes out of um, some of Heidegger as well. The issue here is to transmute the ugliness of experience into a metaphysical category to make the utmost degradation that the human being can inhabit amenable to the mind's understanding. And that's something that's going on in this literature. 
And that's one reason why it's so difficult to grasp and which explains why it's so hard to popularize or translate. Uh, it resists popular categories and demands effort from the reader to translate himself into the position of a thinking victim. That's what's going on there. So you can't read, you have to stop, you have to pause, you have to think um, and become the thinking being who has gone through. There's a strange story in the novel, The Journey. It's called The Fairy Tale of Being. And it's told, it's a fairy tale told exclusively in philosophical categories of being and not being. And uh, it would have upset Adorno when he read it. Um, because creation wins out, but it only does so after a metaphysical journey several lines long. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Jeremy, uh, when and how did your father start communicating with you personally about his experiences during the war, and how has you being a child of Holocaust survivors influenced your own life? Um, I don't think I'm the child of Holocaust survivors um, because I negate categories like that. Um, I don't think they help. Um, and people who go around labeling themselves as Holocaust survivors may do so, but I'm not the child of one. Um, my parents shielded me from the events in my childhood. All this was going on around me and must have impacted on my becoming. But they didn't want me to know anything about it, certainly until the age of 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And then I started to realize that, I mean, I, I picked out pictures of Belson um, from the bookshelf uh, and was horrified as a little boy. Maybe I was five or six when I did that and fascinated by the pictures and Probably my father said something or other about it. But he allowed me to grow into the experience um, at a distance, gradually. There were two statements that really surprised me. And I wonder if you could, uh, maybe I misinterpreted, misheard, uh, if you could perhaps address them. One was that Adler didn't really think of this uh, and what occurred as being anti-Semitism. And the other statement was um, the Orthodox Jews were sort of laughing uh, in some respects at the Nazis and that um, the reason so many Jews died uh, was because they didn't understand German, didn't quite understand what was going on in the camps. Because as I understand it, so many, uh, once they arrived and were taken out of the cattle cars, uh, were just marched into the gas chambers immediately. That's correct, yes. What happened, the, the severe problem for people arriving for in a camp was to survive the first two weeks because the disorientation that victims suffered became total and to come from a system of values into a system of no values, a system of reciprocal aid and support to mutual antagonism and universal hostility cannot easily be born. So particularly old people,
very quickly withered under such hostile circumstances. Um, of course, my father knew that this was anti-Semitism and he wrote about anti-Semitism and this was uh, anti-Semitic doctrine. No question, you're, you're absolutely right uh, on that issue. He was never for one minute uh, in doubt about that. Um, he took the view that it was a kind of perverse theology which the Nazis had invented in which the Jew was equated with evil and salvation through Hitler came through the extermination of evil. And that's a view which has been adopted more recently in scholarship. So for him, yes, anti-Semitism was clearly central to the evil that the Nazis were perpetrating. Um, Levy makes this point about uh, people who uh, had insufficient grasp of German and were not able to survive because of that. Um, it's an observation, uh, which is no doubt true because Levy places it there, and it must have been so. I, I guess I would just add, but then he, Adler wants to do go even further and say at the heart of this heinous system is human beings turned into commodities, into objects, right? Uh, and he saw in that, that yes, in this case, this is clearly anti-Semitic, uh, you know, was happening to the Jews by the Germans, but he also extrapolates and can see particularly in the end of his second great scholarly work, uh, Administered Man, that when human beings are administered as, a, as opposed to being governed, when they're simply literally just pushed around and treated as commodities, that's when things go very badly, very quickly. I, I just uh, want to enter a slight qualification something that Peter Pilkins said, um, but perhaps I'm mistaken. I mean, you said that Adler is not present in well, the Theresienstadt yeah. book, yeah. and it seems to me he yeah. is very present. Yeah. I'm, of course, there is all this documentation uh, and evidence, but there are very powerful personal uh, portraits of individuals um, in the camp, which had to be based on his own impressions. There's a great deal of, of psychological observation about how everyone interacts with everyone else. The, there are the portraits of the different t types of response. Yeah the experience and so on. It's, it really is, it isn't a memoir, of course, but it is a highly personal book, it seems to me. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, it, it, what I was trying to say is that what he doesn't do is this happened to me on this particular day, or when I was working as a bricklayer, I learned, or my, my wife, Gertrude, who was uh, but you're absolutely right. Uh, the emotion that is in the book, um, a passage I remember is the famous ins uh, instance of the Bialystok uh, children uh, who were brought to the camp uh, and treated very badly. Uh, and then there was talk about exchanging them and, and for they were gonna end up in Switzerland and uh, th they were orphans. And in fact, Otla Kaf Kafka, uh, volunteers to take care of them. And uh, she and f I think 43 others become the attendants for these 1,000 children, I think it is, uh, who are then taken to Auschwitz and, uh, and immediately killed. A and he'll give that a very cool description of that and then say, you know, how could they say this about this instance and not, you know, tell the truth? I mean, he will really literally erupt in the middle of it. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, he, he is, that's, which again, I think is fascinating. It's like the novels. They're steeped in autobiography, but they're not autobiography. The, the scholarship is steeped in intensely 
uh, experiential observation, but they are not first first person ob uh, uh, accounts. You know? yeah. Well, I had a related question about that, and perhaps I missed this at the beginning. Um, was his study of Theresienstadt principally a, a, a feat of memory, or was he looking at documents? Was it a scholarly thing where he went through the documents that he could that survived the war? I imagine that the documents that he collected, he didn't bring with him. I mean, they must have all been lost. No. They uh, weren't really. Documents. Did you describe all this already? I apologize no, 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 if I didn't. you did. I, no, I, I can. Jeremy, you can. Uh, he brought documents have. with him. And uh, I mean, the, he studied documents in Prague and copied them. And uh, he studied at the Wiener Library in London. Uh, if you look at the apparatus to the Theresienstadt book, you'll see that there's an enormous bibliography there. Practically everything that, everything that had ever been written about the camps and practically everything that had been written that he could get hold of about the camps in general is documented in the uh, apparatus of the Theresienstadt book. And you re it's, it's quite interesting the way that the book is structured. You have to read, you have a narrative to read which you can follow, and then you have very carefully keyed notes, and you have to read together the narrative with the notes, which gives you a documentation uh, bulletproof of uh, Nazi intention leading to murder. And he very clear, for the first time in any book about the camps, he fully documents the relation between the ideology and the execution. And it's all based on documents. He gives a huge number of documents in the book. Just um, to clarify further, it's a great s story, actually. He le when he leaves Theresienstadt in 1944 for Auschwitz, he takes all of the documents that he has collected and puts them in a bra b black attaché um, soft leather suitcase, which we have in the archive, and hands them to Leo Beck in Theresienstadt. Survives the war, comes back to Prague, goes straight to Theresienstadt to collect the documents, and Leo Beck is still there, hands over the black uh, suitcase to uh, Adler, and in the suitcase as well are uh, Adler's poems and short stories. And as well, he carries out the uh, manuscript for Victor Ullmann's Der Kaiser von Atlantis. The only reason we have this opera is that it was saved and Adler carried it out of the camp after the liberation. So he walks out with that black suitcase basically with the next 40 years of his life. Well, I, it, it seems like the, the most, um, the greatest analog to what he did is, the, is, what, is Ringelblum. I mean, saving all of this stuff. He didn't bury it in milk cans, but right. he managed to save it and recover it after the war. <coughs> yeah. Another question, Jeremy, to you. Uh, so your father was a very secular, very assimilated Jew, and yet he came into contact with uh, these Orthodox Jews, I, I guess in Auschwitz, and you said that he was very much influenced by them. Did he then embrace uh, Judaism ritualistically? And then I also wondered if at the end of his life he was very disappointed and frustrated that more of his work had not been published. Um. Auschwitz meant the end of any rituals for him. Uh, at first, any celebration, commemoration, burial, ceremony uh, meant nothing. Uh, and one has heard this of many people who've been through that. Um, and he never became an Orthodox Jew. Uh, he never went to shul. Uh, it didn't mean anything to him. He read a lot, he would study, he had a, a big library of Judaica, he would spend a lot of time reading Jewish texts, um, he worked through the whole Talmud, um, 
but no, he wasn't an observant Jew, and observant Jews wouldn't recognize him. Um, yes, he did become frustrated uh, at the failure of his novels to achieve publication and success. Um, it, it did embitter uh, his later years, but um, he had a lot of other things to do. Yeah, I, mean, I guess if I can go back to the picture of him, and you know, this is this is him at uh, the end of his life, and he remains productive. What we haven't even talked about here is his work as a poet. His collected poems were published uh, three years ago, twelve hundred pages long, uh, and uh, he writes one hundred and eighty short stories. Uh, uh, 90 of which are published in his lifetime in uh, three different volumes, and the rest are in manuscript, all very carefully ordered, all very carefully dated. Uh, he creates 11 manuscripts of poetry, dating them and saying when each poem was, was written. He, he was clearly writing for the future, clearly writing for the drawer. Uh, the other thing I want to say, he takes under his wing a number of young men who, uh, whose fathers had gone through the war, and quite often uh, non-Jewish uh, uh, German uh, uh, men, and who were troubled about the history and the experience, and he really becomes a teacher, a life guide uh, to them. I've interviewed these people. They, 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 they revere him and uh, talk about the sense of spirituality, grounded spirituality, groundedness, grounded thought, grounded life that, that, that they took away from him. So he. He, he becomes frustrated about the publishing, but he f constantly finds another venue, works on the theology book, uh, the very last book that he published, which was really in some ways the very first book because in 1938, he writes a 26-single-spaced uh, letter on his theology um, from Milan where he's doing some training and hoping to get a visa. Uh, and that he, he sends it to what would later become his second wife, Jeremy's mother. And we have this document now, and you can see it is the, it is the goods of the theology book, uh, which comes out nearly 50 years later. So there's a great variety in his oeuvre um, and in obviously in his life, but there's also this sense of everything being connected, too. All right, I think that's good. There are books available here in front, and... Um, their authors will sign them should you wish to have them signed. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.